Tonight is Wednesday, May 15, 2019, and our message tonight is called Promise Keeper. We just wrapped up uh, Mother's Day. Amen. We got some mothers in the house. Amen. We got some future mothers in the house. Amen. Amen. It was an exciting day. We had a great message from Pastor Wade called Preserving the Promise, a Mother's Value. We talked about how men are formed, but women are built. That is a great word. My wife just walked out of the room. My wife is built just for me. She was built for me. She was built for a purpose. Women are built for a purpose. They were built to preserve a promise. And not just a promise in their own children, but even in the children around them. Whether they have their own children or not, women are built to preserve the promise. Amen. We had Wade preach Feet on Fire. It was a recap of the 2019 India trip in a town called Salem. And here, Pastor Wade encouraged us out of Isaiah 52.1 to awake, awake, clothe yourselves with strength, shake off the dust and rise up. If you want to find out more about India, take out JJ for coffee. Or you could, you could have Andrew over for dinner. He's a, he's a single man. He's famished. <laughs> he's at my house every night. And uh, so just don't, I want to share him with you and share the testimony. So have this brother over to your house and, and feed him well. He will, we learned in India he will eat anything put in front of him. So it doesn't matter how good or how gooder it is. That whatever food you make, he will eat. Amen. Amen. Uh, we had a message called Tent Makers, God's Glory Within from Pastor Eric and Pastor Matt. There's a pattern of tent making and it has to do with God's image, God's nature, and God's glory. And that pattern is given to us and it's for us because we are made in the image of our Creator. We are to, our, to participate in the divine nature and the spirit of glory and of God rests upon us. See, we are tents. And we're also making tents. Amen? Who in here remembers Eric's word, fire and glory? There are three elements that are needed for this. The first was fuel. It was a, a, a plural unity. That, that unity that is not just good enough for you to be right with God, but you've also got to be right with one another. We need air, which is holiness. Not only are we supposed to be made holy, we're supposed to be helping each other be made holy. And we need that spark, which is a singular focus. Do you want the fire and the glory tonight? We can have it. Amen. You guys want to talk about some promises tonight? Let's do it. Turn to Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 1. Say promise keeper when you get there. Amen. Take anyone back to the 90s. Promise keeper. I'm going to start in verse 1. This is a verse that uh, Justin shared with us at the end of the message on Sunday. And it just sparked something in my soul. It was a, a man, it was a fantastic word. We start with verse 1. It says, Sing, O barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy, you who were never in labor. I'm going to stop there because that, uh, honestly, at face value, that seems a little... It's a little, a little unnatural. Seeing O barren woman uh, burst into song, shout for joy. Uh, who, who, who having not received their promise, a barren woman, wants to burst into song? I mean, honestly, let's just think about it. Who wants to burst into a song if you haven't received your promise? What does bursting into a song even look like? I mean, is it, is it, is it Julie Andrews on the side of a mountain talking about the sound of music? I mean, what does bursting into a song look like? That's what I think. I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself. but What does it look like to burst into a song when you haven't had your promise, when the Lord hasn't quite fulfilled it yet? But how much more should those of us holding the promise be full of joy? See, some of us are already holding our promise. We have like 2,000 babies coming this year. Close. Uh, very close. It's, it's a good thing I'm in estimations. 2,000 babies coming this year. See, the promise has already come for some of us. The promise is yet to come, and it's an exciting thing. How much more should we be full of joy as we, as we get to hold our promise in our hands? And we have so many people looking forward to that. Whether the promise is a baby or whether the promise is a marriage, holding our promise in our hand, man, that's exciting. We should be full of joy. Uh, I read a verse the other day. Uh, I was actually sitting in a discount tire reading, and a guy came, Hey, what are you reading? What's the word for today? Well, actually, this is what I'm reading. Deuteronomy 28:47, a very convicting word. 
It says, because you did not serve the Lord your God joyfully and gladly in the time of prosperity. And I just stopped there. and I'm like, okay. Because the rest of it is what the Lord's going to do with, his, with the enemies to you. So I'm not going to go there. But because you did not serve the Lord your God joyfully and gladly in the time of prosperity. See, the Lord has already told us this is a season of prosperity. He's already told us he's going to pour out a spirit. He's going to bless us. And not just monetarily. We see it. I mean, look at the babies all around us. Look at the life. Uh, look at the look. I mean, we had 20 kids. I was actually a, a real estimation. I would have won that bid. We had 20 kids on the front stage. And uh, man, our promises are right before us. We should be serving the Lord joyfully and gladly in this time of prosperity. And these kids are so much. Better. In fact, they're back in the back room right now. They're going to share words with each other. They've been working. They've been gathering scriptures this last week. And John has encouraged them to share with each other. And that's what they're doing right now, man. They're 9, 10, 11 years old, man. What was I doing at 9, 10, 11? Kicking the can, kicking the I wasn't doing that. Playing Nintendo, playing whatever was set in front of me. I wasn't doing that. But this is the promise. This is what the Lord is blessing us with. You see, we have to have joy. Whether we've received our promise or not, this is a time of prosperity. And we must have joy in this season. Amen. You want to turn to Philippians two fourteen through fifteen. Something that, something the Lord showed me this week is this scripture. It's uh, necessary to have joy to follow this scripture. Say there when you're there. It says do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. Does it say do some things? Does it say do most things? Do a few things? No, it says that we're supposed to do everything without complaining or arguing. I'm at a place where I hear that a lot at my work. Like, like every day. Like almost every moment of every day, contractors come to me and like to complain about things. See, but it's so easy to get trapped whenever you're around that to want to fall into that same trap yourself. Or maybe you're not even in that situation. Maybe you're living that prosperous life that he's bringing us into, but you're still struggling with, well, man, I haven't, I haven't experienced that promise yet. I haven't experienced that marriage yet that God wants to give me. I haven't experienced the children. I, I, I've been waiting for quite a few years, but I, I haven't experienced it yet. See, what it's talking about here, that word complaining, that's, that's an outward murmuring. That's, that's grumbling. That's, that's something that's produced out of your lips. But maybe you could say, well, I'm, I'm not really outwardly complaining. I'm not saying things that are terrible, but... That word arguing means your inner thoughts. See, it's one thing to just not say things out loud, but it's a different thing whenever you're actually meditating on how bitter you want to be. It's another thing when you're meditating on what you don't have and what you want. I know I've fallen into that trap more than most. And God is bringing me to a place where I'm finding joy. This may be weird to some people. Maybe, maybe to people like Rob that have had experiences with me in the mornings. Maybe with uh, some of my other brothers who have uh, spent time with me in the morning. But I begin to smile in the morning. It's kind of different. It's not what I'm used to. But God has been changing my heart to where it's not just, not just something that's... It's actually coming out of me. It's actually... I'm not waking up and, and having an attitude problem with everybody around me. He's actually transforming my heart. Amen. He's actually putting a smile on my face as soon as I wake up, whether I got four hours of sleep whether I got three and a half like last night, or whether I got six and a half. See, because he's changing my heart. Whenever you ask him, God, would you help me to be content with every situation I'm in? Guess what? He'll bring joy. Whenever you stop complaining in your life, whether it's outwardly coming out or whether it's inwardly, guess what? He's going to bring that joy into your life. It's the easiest way to destroy joy in your life is when you start complaining. Whenever you have that bitterness in your heart, that's the easiest way to destroy joy. This is what I'm trying to do at work. Nehemiah 8, verse 10, if you want to go there. Say joy when you get there. Nehemiah 8, 10, it says, Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice foods and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. Man, doesn't that sound amazing? This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Man, sometimes we think that Red Bull is going to be our strength. 
Sometimes that second cup of coffee is going to do us in. But what the Word of God teaches us is that our strength comes from the joy that God wants to give us. What in your life today do you need to put off that's complaining? What in you do you need to, to lay aside, throw off everything that hinders and say, no, I'm taking that off of my life. I'm getting rid of this so that I can put on joy. What is that weakness that God is wanting to eradicate out of your life so that you can put on joy, so that you can have the strength that God wants you to have, so that you can do what these, the Lord's telling you to do, so you can be filled with joy, so that you can walk out the scriptures, the mezuzahs, the things that he's placed on your lives to do. Amen. You guys going to put on joy tonight? Yeah. Amen. Then turn with me to Isaiah 54. You're going to want to put a bookmark because we're just, we're just going gonna, gonna to stick here for a little bit. All night, actually. Isaiah 54, verse 1. I'll keep coming back. We're starting verse 1 again. We'll go to the second part. We'll get, we'll get the verse 2 eventually. Isaiah 54, verse 1. We'll start over. Sing, O barren woman, you who never bore a child. Burst into song. Shout for joy, you who are never in labor. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. To me, that it, it, uh, it, it's, uh, it was hard for me to understand what that verse said, just, just sitting there, right there. I wasn't exactly sure what that meant. So I was looking around in some commentary. I found a, some Jewish commentary, uh, actually a rabbi from a couple thousand years ago. He was said to teach, uh, he taught millions. His students were millions. And, uh, and so I want, to, uh, I want to read something from him. He was actually from an area, I think some of you probably visited uh, before uh, the Turkey team may have, have been around in these areas, those that have been to Israel, he's, he's from an area called Tarsus. So, um, if you turn to Galatians chapter four, we're gonna we're gonna see some commentary uh, on Isaiah fifty four. Galatians four, and we'll start in uh, we'll start in verse twenty three. Joy when you're there, Amen. Verse 23, his son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a promise. We'll stop there. You've got born in the ordinary way or born as a result of the promise. What's the ordinary way? In context, we're looking at, uh, at Galatians 4. He's talking about Hagar and Sarah. So born in the ordinary way it was Abram decided to do it in his own strength uh, to listen to advice that wasn't directly from the Lord. And he tried to create, he tried to fulfill the promise the Lord had given him in his own strength. That's the ordinary way. How many of us keep trying day after day to fulfill God's promises in an ordinary way? We, we try, well, I do it every day. I have to stop myself and remind myself, Lord, you're the, you're the one that makes all of this possible. I, I think I've, I've got some kind of sense over, over the years. I've got some kind of experience but the Lord constantly reminds me, you know, it's not in your own strength. You, you're not even, I mean, personally, you're not even a salesman. That's not even who you are. But this is where I put you because this is where I want you. And so he's constantly reminding me over and over that, that I can't fulfill his promise in the ordinary way. Abraham couldn't fulfill his promise in the ordinary way. It says, but a son by the free woman was born as the result of a promise. We have Isaac, who's born as a result of a promise. When Abraham thought himself as good as dead, his body was over. They were too old to have kids. God fulfilled his promise. It was a promise that was, uh, it was, Isaac was born as the result of a promise. And that's where we should be. We should be trusting the Lord, not relying on our own strength. Not listening to man's wisdom, but listening to the Lord and trusting in Him and walking out this promise. Because the promise is a process. It's not something that we just get, uh, it's not, maybe if we're lucky, the Lord say, this is going to happen and, and right then it happens. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you if that happens to you. Amen. You are highly favored. But the Lord has highly favored me to cause me to walk out the promises, to walk out the process of the promise. So I don't quite have all the promises the Lord has given me yet, but I know I'm trusting in him that he's going to fulfill it, uh, is that I'm going to have a son that's born as a result of a promise. Are you going to have the son that's born as a result of a promise? Yes. yes. Amen. Let's go on to verse 28. 
It says, now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of a promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. It is the same now. But what does scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son. For the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Isn't this what the Lord was already speaking to us tonight? What did he say to us? Live free as a son. Because I pierce your ear. Stop living like a slave and live free. The Lord's already told us that tonight during worship. And he's reminding us again that we don't have to live as children of the slave woman, but live as children of the free woman. Live as children of a promise. Church, we are children of a promise. Let me ask you a question, church. Who's the promise keeper? This is the part where you, you can talk. If I need to come down here, I, I'll, I'll do that so we can be more personable. I'm going to be... Three feet up. Who's the promise keeper? The Lord? Yes and no. See, the Lord is the promise keeper. He will never fail to keep his promise. His promises last for generations. He has a promise for a people. He has a promise for a land. There's a master plan that he's not going to fail. His promises are never going to fail. But he's not the only promise keeper. You see, church, we're promise keepers. It's our job to keep his promise to us. That sounds kind of, sounds kind of crazy. Well, how am I going to keep someone else's promise? It's our job to keep his promise to us. It's our job to keep walking out this promise as a process over and over again, trusting whether we get to see the promise in our hands today or nine months from now or nine years from now, God's going to fulfill his promise and it's our job to keep his promise. So let me ask you again, church, who are the promise keepers? Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing what the word of God teaches about who we are? See, if we, if we actually open up the Word and we read it, we allow it to breathe its breath of life in us and we actually believe what it says towards us, we get to realize that we are promise keepers. We get to realize that we are sons of God that get to live free. Let's hear what something else the Scripture says. It's 1 Peter 2, verse 9, and we're going to read through 10. 1 Peter 2. Say, so keep His promise when you get there. 9 through 10. says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Man, isn't that amazing that the word of God teaches us that we are a royal priesthood. It says that people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Man, that is good news, isn't it? Who in here believes that scripture towards themselves? Do you actually believe that you are a royal priesthood in a holy nation? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing what the word teaches us? That we can walk rightly with him? We've got to believe the word. We've actually got to take off that darkness that we once were. We've got to stop living how we used to live. We've got to stop thinking how we used to think. We've got to stop walking in the muck that we once walked in. Or thinking that we should go back. In fact... What we should do is put on his light. We should put on that wonderful light that he's given us. Amen. Amen. Church, you want to keep his promise? Yes. All right, then turn to Isaiah 54. We're going to be here all night. Verse 2. Verse 2. It says, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cord. Strengthen your stakes. And I heard a good message uh, a couple years ago, 2017, the One Association Conference. Was there anybody there? Y'all remember actually sitting under a tent? Man, it was a glorious time. I was being carried away as either by the Spirit of the Lord or by giant mosquitoes. I don't know. It was one of those two or both. Uh, and uh, the Arising Church gave us a very powerful word about this, about stretching wide our tents. You see, this is our promise. To enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide, do not hold back, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. This is our promise. This was our promise back then, and this is our promise today. This is still our promise. We're still walking that promise of stretching out our tents. You see, sometimes our concept of God's promise is too small. It's limited, or maybe over time we just we forget about it. Forget about it. You know, we just we just do. We we lose track of it. 
it gets out of our out of our sight, our immediate vision, and it just it gets in the peripheral. Uh, what what could that look like? Like uh, marriage. Some sometimes we think promise is the marriage. That's the goal. You know, I got to get there, man. I walk down. I say, just say I do. Just say I do. We're gonna get there. But we all know it doesn't it doesn't stop there. That's where it starts, man. We continue to walk out the promise of marriage, and we get these marriage enrichment classes to help us keep the promise. Children, uh, same thing. You know, we we uh, we labor. We get to that point. We have the child. The promise is there, and the promises continue to be walked out. And then we get family enrichment classes to help us keep that promise. Uh, we have a limited uh, idea of a concept of how God's promises are. Let me let me demonstrate it to you. Uh, Let's go back to the tent in Louisiana. This is pretend this is the tent. So this is God's promise to us. He's telling us to stretch wide the tent curtains. And this is the place. This is the tent where I've, I've told you to settle. I've told you to raise a family. I've told you to be here. This is a tent. Wall to wall. This whole altar area is a tent. Timo, can I have your chair? Thank you. I'll give it back. I promise. I promise. I'll keep my promise. A lot of us are, see, we got this whole tent, we got this promise that the Lord has given us, you know, and we, we've got so much that we can do with the promise. But sometimes over time, we, uh, we, we find something that's, you know, man, I, I'm just, I'm feeling tired, I'm feeling just, man, I don't know if I can, I can go on anymore, I just, I'm just going to sit down for a little bit, I'm just going to, I'm just going to rest my laurels, I'm just going to sit, I'm still in the tent, I'm still here, I'm sitting here. But a lot of times, some of us get too content with just sitting here in the tent. Yeah, I'm in the tent. But this tent's 400 square feet. I've got four square feet that I'm only living in. Are you going to live in the promise that God has given you? Are you? That means we've got to get up, church. We've got to rise up. We've got to move around. We've got to live in the promise that the Lord has given us and not settle with the four square feet that's comfortable. It's, I'm surrounded in a tent. It, it looks like I'm in a promise. Lord, you, yeah, you've given it to me. Yeah, you've given me a family. You've given me kids. That's enough. I don't have to discipline them. I don't have to, I don't have to spank them. I don't have to do any of that. That's, no. No, that's part of living in the promise. Maybe, maybe you're right here. Now you got a, you got a wife. you got kids. You're over here. Yeah. Or maybe you're sitting back here now. Now I'm kind of on the edge of the promise. Yeah, I'm just relaxing, feeling the breeze. Man, it's nice to have the promise fulfilled. I got a wife. I got kids. He's calling you to more. He's calling you to raise up generations. You saw the 20 kids up here, the promises. He's calling you to live in the promises he called you to. He's saying stretch out the tent curtain, stretch them wide so that you can truly live in the promise that he's given you. I promise I'll give you your chair back. I'm going to keep my promise. You see, he wants us to live in the tent. He wants us to live in prosperity. This is a season of prosperity, but it's going to take some work. He wants us to stretch our tent curtains wide. He says, don't hold back. He says, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. In Ephesians 4, 22, just to, you put it on the screen, I have to turn there. It says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. This is a familiar verse for us, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. You see, we've got to put off something. If we're going to stretch wide the tent curtains, if we're going to live in the promise, we've got to pull up stake, church. We've got to move it. We've got to stretch our tent wide. It requires some work. It requires for us to put off some things. The normal way of life. Well, that stake goes there. Well, maybe you need to pull it up. Maybe you need to strengthen your cords. Maybe you need to stretch them out to truly live in the promise that God has given you. In verse 23, it says, To be made new in the attitude of your minds. It's like lengthening your cords. You got to lengthen your cords. You know, sometimes when you lengthen your cords, you put, you you pull, you tug, you stretch them. Sometimes they break. What happens when you break a cord? You, you can talk to me. Again. It's okay. You got to replace it. So what what do you got to do to replace it? You got to buy it, right? You got to go buy a new cord. It's going to cost. Revelation three eighteen. If you could throw that up on the screen, real quick. When I think of, of a cost, when you lengthen your cords. When you're living in the promise and the prosperity the Lord has called you, sometimes it costs you. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. It costs. So you can become rich. And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. 
and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. See, there's a cost to lengthening our cords. In verse 24 of Ephesians 4, it says, And to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, we need to strengthen our stakes. Not only do we need to take off the old self, we also need to put on something new. We need to strengthen our stakes. We're undoing some things in our life. We're stretching. We're pulling. We're moving. We're fulfilling God's promise. We're trying to keep His promise. And then we've got to strengthen our stakes, church. We've got to put them in. We've got to make them solid so they won't move. That's us fulfilling His promise. And it requires work. And it comes at a cost. I want to challenge you tonight, church. Strengthen your stakes. Keep the promise, church. If you want to go to Ephesians 4.25, isn't that amazing what, what JJ has been saying? It, what we tend to do is we think, oh, if we, if we just get the wife or we just get the husband that we want, man, then I've arrived. Man, if I, if I just get that, that, that child that I've been looking for, then may, maybe I've arrived. Maybe if I get that job that I've been looking for, maybe I've arrived. Maybe if I get the next thing in my life, then maybe I've arrived. But the fact is, is that God is calling us to much more than that. The fact is, is that we can actually live resurrected life now. He's given us that promise for the future, just like we sang about. No grave can hold me down. We have that resurrected life, and we can walk in it now. But we keep so narrow-minded sometimes that, oh, if I just get that next thing, it'll be good. If I just get that, if I just get that wife, it'll be good. See, we got to open our mind, open our desires to actually walk in the fullness of Christ. See, if you read there, it says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Keep reading. It says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. See, we've got to take off the old grave clothes. Just like Lazarus, we've got to take off the things that have been hindering us, and we've got to actually start doing right. It says, it says, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Why? Because there's something that you should probably be doing. You should probably be taking off the angry, being made new in the attitude of your mind, and putting on that new self that is filled with joy. If you keep reading, it says, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Are you saying it's not good enough just to say, I'm sorry? Are you saying it's not good enough just to say, Lord, would you forgive me? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said this thing to that person. I took that. Uh, you know, we, we talk about stealing and, you know, you could say, well, I, don't, I haven't like stolen anything from the grocery store. I haven't gone and, and stole something from my friends. I haven't taken cash out of my work. But what about the time that you've stolen from your work? What about the time that You've been taking, you've been receiving, you've been getting information, but you don't pour out. What about when you become a consumer and you forget to pour out into others? See, the last thing we should want to do is just, just repent from something and just say, well, I'm just not going to do that anymore. What we should want to do is have that renewed attitude in our mind, that newness of self, putting on those righteous garbs and doing what he's called us to do. The next verse, it keeps going. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that I may benefit those who listen. Man, I can be guilty of this. I mean, I'm not talking about just yelling at somebody or cussing. I'm, I'm talking about when you're talking to your brother and you degrade them just to be funny. Or you say something mean to be funny and it's lighthearted, but at the same moment, that's not building up your brother. The same moment, that's not building up the body of Christ. The word says to take, get rid of that speech. Begin to build one another up so that we can walk in the promise that God's given us. We have to walk it out. Amen. Andrew, have you ever heard of the term breaking and entering? Yes. I think of, that's usually associated with what? Theft, right? With stealing, breaking and entering. Uh, I see a lot of us in here. Oh, I'm going to let you continue on. But I think a lot of us, uh, we understand that conceptually as a, uh, what is it, a misdemeanor, a felony? I don't, I don't know. Someone help me out here. Felony, probably breaking and entering. I don't know. Breaking and entering. We can we associate it's bad. That's what you're saying. But uh, we may think we we don't, we don't break and enter. But how many of us we enter? We may not break in, but we enter. Maybe even into the back of the sanctuary, we enter in, and we just we just sit here and we like Andrew was saying, we sit and soak and we just 
bring it in? Are we, are we just stealing from our brothers and our sisters when we're actually called to more? We're actually called to pour out and to give. We may not be breaking and entering, but we're entering and the same result is happening. It may not be physically. There may not be computers and, and laptops and, and Bibles walking out of here being stolen, you know, but there's there's something that maybe I need something from you. Maybe maybe my wife needs to be encouraged by you, but you've stolen that encouragement from her because you basically broke and entered and you stole a blessing, but you forgot to give. You forgot to give back. And so I think that's what Andrew is saying when it talks about stealing. I don't want to, I just don't want to just lose that. Um, we need to, it's in that same train of thought of having our minds, having only wholesome words coming out so we can build each other up. Let's stop, uh, let's stop breaking and entering and let's come in and let's give. Let's pour out our lives. Let's come with a word. Let's come, let's come with something to give to someone else. Even if you don't know who it is, whatever you've been reading, whatever the Lord's been speaking to you that day or that week, let's come expecting to pour out and not just receive all the time, church. Let's give some examples. For instance, lust. That, that item, that, that object that you're desiring, that, that object that you put your affection on and distracts you from the Lord. You've got to do something. You can't, you can't just put it off. You actually have to put on self-control and begin to desire the Lord. You have, to, you have to long for Him with all of your heart, soul, and strength. If you're lazy, you actually have to put on diligence. You have to stop being lazy. You have to stop spacing out at work. You have to stop sitting. You have to get up. And you actually have to do something and be diligent, whether it's prayer, whether it's study, work, ministering with your brothers, ministering to your brothers. You actually have to stop being lazy and do something. Be the forceful man that God's created you to be. If you're critical, figure out how to encourage others. If you, if, you, if, if you have those internal thoughts, well, oh man, I don't think he was right in that. Oh man, I think that prayer was kind of weak. I mean, I, I think he could have done a little better there. I think he could have preached a little better. When you have those thoughts, you know what you should do? Get rid of the thoughts and start thinking, how can I encourage him in every way? When you're selfish, how can I start serving? I know in India, I, I, I was talking with Wade about this. We're talking about uh, radical amputations. And there was a moment where I'm like, man, I, kind of towards the last day of the trip, I'm like, I want to buy this one thing. The funny thing is I already had one. But man, I had my eyes set on it. Like, man, I got I to gotta get one of those. I got to buy one. I can see my selfish nature rising. And I'm like, why? I already have one. So instead of just saying, well, I'm just not going to buy it, what I begin to do is, how can I buy something for somebody else? How can I pour out my money? How can I do whatever it takes for me to pour out to somebody else? And it's not just money. I, I, I wrote down a scripture and I gave it to somebody. I shared with him the very word that I thought was for him. And it blessed his life completely. So you've got to learn how to not just take something off, but some, put something on. These, these hit close to me because these are my Naval traits. These are things that I am personally dealing with trying to take off. And to put on righteousness and do what he's called me to do. What about you guys? What, what are the Naval traits that God is showing you, revealing to you? Hey, these have to go. I need to get rid of these. What are the Abigail traits that he wants you to put on and be faithful to? Amen. I want to I brag on Andrew just for a minute. As we're in India, uh, he's, he's, he's being very vulnerable and talking about his Naval traits. Uh, but he was actually walking that out. John, not just in the last day. You're, you're a little too humble, Andrew. But uh, almost every meal, you know, he's he's fighting to pay. He's trying to slip the credit card. If, if there's a place that would take a credit card, Andrew's there trying to trying to pay the bill. Uh, not that we didn't have an, enough for the trip, but so that we could leave more than an offering for the church. You know, because if we can put it on the card, then we can leave some cash uh, for the people there, for the church there. But Andrew is actively fighting his Nabal traits and he's being unselfish and he's serving others. And he did that the whole trip. One just the last day. So I just wanted to, to brag on my brother a little bit and say I'm proud of him uh, for doing that. For putting off the old and putting on the new. Let's continue doing that. Let's continue keeping his promises. Let's go back to Isaiah 54. We'll pick up in verse 3. Verse 3. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Church, this is our prosperity. 
This is prosperity. Spread out to the, light, to the right and to the left. We saw it sitting right in front of us. We see it in our kids. We see it as we walk out uh, every day in our life. Uh, it involves our descendants. It involves our children. And it involves them living, into the, uh, living under the shadow of our wings. Because as we're faithful to stretch out the, that tent, as we're faithful to reach out, uh, to pull up stakes, to stretch the tent, to lengthen our cords, and to strengthen our stakes, as we're faithful to do that, our children will crush their enemies and settle in their desolate cities. Does anybody want their children to crush their enemies? Yeah. Is anyone crushing their enemies right now? Yeah. All right. How much more should our children crush their enemies? In Deuteronomy 6 and Joshua 1, uh, he's, it says clearly that he's giving us the land, but we're to go in and take possession of it. You see, it's not just enough to trust in the promise of the Lord. It's not just enough for him to say, this is yours. This land is your land. This land is mine. It's not enough. You got to go in and you got to possess it. You got to take hold of it. Because not only do I want to crush my enemies, I want to crush those enemies so my son doesn't ever have to see those enemies. Those are the ball traits that I have to fight. I don't want him to ever have to mess with those. He's going to have enough giants of his own the way this world is going. He doesn't need to deal with my Nabal traits. So I'm doing my very best, like Andrew is, to crush the Nabal traits in my life because I want to spread wide the tent. Because I want my son and my children to live in prosperity. And I want them to crush their enemies and settle in their desolate cities. But we've got to take possession of a church. We've got to go get it, church. You're going to go get it, church? Yeah. Amen. Amen. If you want to turn to Luke 8, we're going to read verse 11 through 15. It says, This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. I don't think that's anybody in this room. I don't think there's anybody that... Uh, is at the point right now where I can say, yeah, that seed's being stolen from you. But the fact is, is that we have to guard it. We have to not put our guard down and say, well, that can't be me. That won't be me. That, that's not me at all. We actually have to guard something. We have to guard the word that he's placed inside of our lives. Yeah. So those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. See, we have to dig deep roots. Just like it's talking about with strengthening your tent pegs, you have to dig deep roots into his kingdom. It said, the seed that fell along thorns stand for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. So it reminds me of having that thought process, that mentality of, well, what if I never get the promises? What if I never get the things that God has for my life? What if I don't get to enjoy Enjoy the things that I believe God wants for me. Well, don't let those thoughts crush your life because they're not true. The fact is, is that God has always been faithful. All of his ways are just. All of them are perfect. You have promises inside of the word of God. You have good things inside his word, and you actually have to believe them. You actually have to trust that he's going to give them to you. It says, but the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart. who we hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. I'm reminded of just a faithful day-to-day -day work attitude. A faithful going about your business, doing your work, and being faithful. And being faithful with the last thing he told you to do. See, I, I, I'm asking the Lord Monday, and I'm, I'm kind of panicking. And I'm like, Lord, what do you, what do you want me to preach about? I, there's like 15 things you're trying to show me. Like there's all these things that I could preach about. What are you trying to show me? And I feel like there's just this blankness, this I got nothing, Lord. Okay, I, I'm in trouble. Okay, they, oh man, we got to preach in two days. Lord, would you help me? And then he began to wash over me and speak to me about being faithful with the things that he's already placed in my life to do. See, we have so many good teachings. We have so many good messages. If we just were faithful with what God has already shown us and given us, oh my God. Oh. If we were just faithful what he's already told us to do, and I'm not, I'm not talking about specific things he's told us to do. I'm talking about what is the last thing that you preached about in prison? Are you being faithful to walk it out? What's the last thing you shared in a home group? Are, are you being faithful to walk it out? What's the last thing you preached about on the stage? Are you, are you being faithful to walk it out? Man, if, if we're just faithful with what he's already given us, 
if we're faithful with the children he has given us, with the single life he has given us, with the households he's given, if we're just faithful with those things, oh my goodness, we could actually bear some amazing fruit. And I believe that there are men and women of God in this household that are walking like that. I believe that there is a faithfulness. And the Lord is saying, rise up, be even more faithful. Be me even more faithful with the things I've given you. Amen. This is a church full of good soil who hears the word, retains it, and by pers- persevering produce a crop. produces a crop. But as Andrew is saying, let's be more faithful, church. Let's not forget the promises of the Lord. Let's continue to persevere and walk out these promises that he's given us. See, our promises aren't just for, for us to enjoy. They're for the generations beyond us. They're for people that we'll never even associate with. They're for people like halfway across the world. This has nothing to do with us. The promise, I mean, that, I think that's, we, sometimes we get caught up in our own self and, and we think, man, God's going to fulfill his promise to me. So excited. I don't know. I mean, sorry. But it's not about me. We get excited about ourselves. We get excited about, uh, you know, just him fulfilling his promise. But our, his promise, his promise. Let's forget it's not our promise, it's his promise. His promise is not just for us. It's for people all over this world because he's doing something greater than us. And we're going to continue to keep his promises. Let's turn back to Isaiah 54. We're going to finish this passage. We're going to get there. I promise. And I'm going to keep my promise. Verse 4. It says, do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth. And remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. Isn't that, isn't that the very last, last song that we sung about? Talking about shame being obliterated because he's rose from the grave and we're going to rise. I mean, it, we, we sang about it, so let's start walking it out. You know, this, is, this is a verse uh, that's been very personal to us uh, just in the last several days. This last weekend, we got uh, a random text. How many of you love random texts? You know, it's a lovely. You know, you know what I'm talking about. We get a text from a, uh, a uh, family member that, um, that the man who, who, raised, who helped raise Natalie uh, from childhood uh, actually passed away. And so uh, for a long time, for 10, 12 years, he's been, he's been spiritually dead anyway. He, when all this stuff came out, he was a reprobate with a reprobate mind. So he's been cut off for years anyway. Uh, but to get that phone call, uh, you know, sometimes those things uh, stir some things up because there's always that hope of not just, uh, you know, our, our mezuzah is, um, is to repair by cultivating an atmosphere of restoration. So our hope for everyone is restoration. We want restoration. We want a chance for repentance. We want people to make right with the Lord and get, and get their ships together. Uh, that's what we desire. <laughs> that's, our, that's our calling. Uh, is to help people get their ships together. Uh, and so we desired that for the longest time, you know, and so, but to get that call, it was, it was kind of sobering because the chance for repentance is gone. The chance for restoration is gone. And so it's, uh, it's like a death all over again. We, ex- we already experienced death, a spiritual death. Now a physical death, it just stirs things up. One of the things it can stir up is uh, it can stir up shame. It can stir up fear um, because this is being uh, because you were tied to things in your past. I know all of us, um, you know, have things that have happened in our past that that maybe we, we want to shout from the rooftops. Maybe there's some things that we don't want to shout from the rooftops. We want to bury, we want to keep it buried. We want it to stay there until the Lord resurrects it and then obliterates it in the Valley of Armageddon. That's what we want our past to stay. But when we get these random texts. Uh, that the Lord helps to work things out of our lives, we begin to uh, we begin to see, you know, maybe maybe there's a little bit more work the Lord wants to do, and these um, you know these these feelings come up, you know, uh, and in that moment, this is uh, I mean after this is the verse that we're studying on Sunday morning. This is the verse that Justin gives up and shares to us, and it's just an encouragement that the Lord is giving to us. He says, "You don't have to be afraid." You don't have, you're not going to suffer shame. It says, do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach 
of your widowhood. You see, the past can't define us, whether it's 15 years ago or whether it's 15 minutes ago. The past cannot define us. Shame cannot define us. Disgrace cannot define us. Humiliation cannot define us. I'm reminded, I'm reminded of Psalm 34, verses 4 through 5. It says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Not just some of them, not just the ones that, uh, that are still, uh, you know, hanging around or the, even the ones 10, 20, 15 years ago. He's delivering me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. So all your fears, they're obliterated. You're delivered. He is the Lord, our deliverer. And those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. So the Lord is encouraging us. We don't have to live in shame. We don't have to live in humiliation. If we continue to take off the old self, we continue to pull up the pegs and stretch wide those tents and strengthen, uh, lengthen our cords and strengthen the pegs. If we take off the old and put on the new. We don't have to live in that shame. We don't have to live in that humiliation because we're children of a promise and we are living in the promise. And church, I want to encourage you tonight to keep that promise, to keep living in the promise. Don't look back. Paul says, forget what's behind. Forget about it. Lord, I'm pressing on. And I, there's a goal in mind. There's something I'm moving forward to. Who cares about the past? Even if it gets trudged up 15 years later. You know what? That's not me. That's not me. That's who I am. That's where the Lord's taking me. Forget about my shame. The Lord's doing something new in my life. And church, we got to keep the promise the Lord has given us. we got to keep persevering in the promise the Lord has given us, church. Leviticus 26, 13. 13, 13, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. Man, he has set each person in this room free so that we don't have to go back to Egypt. We actually don't have to. We can walk forward with him faithfully because he has been faithful to us because he has loved us first it has given us the ability to love Him. It's given us the ability to be faithful to Him. See, He has brought us out of Egypt not to go back in any way, shape, or form, but to run towards Him, to run towards the things that He has for our lives. And you've got to take off shame. You've got to take off the past that wants to hold you back. You've got to take off the thoughts of, well, I did this 10 years ago. Yeah, that doesn't matter. What you've got to focus on is the things that the Lord has brought you out of and what He's bringing you to. I'm, I, I was overwhelmed in India. I was, I was on uh, the top of uh, Anna's roof, and I'm praying, and I begin to feel the presence of God. I haven't slept in like three days, it feels like. And I begin to feel the overwhelming presence of God, and I begin to weep because I think of, man, the things that He has brought me out of, the darkness that He has brought me out of. Man, I can walk with my head held high. I don't have to walk with my head hanging low, but He has brought me out of darkness. And I'm not just talking about a drug addict that He saved. I'm talking about somebody that was a, a, a reprobate, somebody that called themselves a Christian, but hated God in my heart, would not follow Him. He has rescued me out of that dead religion and brought me into a life with Him, a transformed life where I don't have to walk in darkness. He has done the same thing for you. You can walk in that freedom. You can walk with your heads held high and you don't have to look at the past. You don't have to let it define you anymore. You don't have to let last week define you. You can rise up and say, yeah, I may have messed up last week, but this week I'm getting it right. I may have failed last week, but I'm getting it right now. Rise up in this place. And stop looking behind you and trust where he's taking you. Amen, church. We got to keep the promise. Got to keep the promise. That means we got to walk in that promise. Let's go to Isaiah 54. We're going to verse 5. It's going to be the last verse here. It's a beautiful verse. Verse 5. It says, For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. Who is your husband? If we're the church, if we're the bride of Christ. Who's our husband? Look at this description of, of the husband. A maker. The creator of all things. He's a maker. The Lord Almighty. The Holy One of Israel. Your Redeemer. The God of all the earth. I mean, just in this one verse, we have five descriptors of your husband, church. 
I mean, God has done so much. This is our husband. This is like a, a, a powerful uh, five-sided just mm, gem. And see, our husbands, when you get married, you get a new name. All right. So we, we were talking earlier about about our past. You see, m- my wife, she's not tied to her past. because She's got a new name. So her last name is Moloch. She's a Moloch. She's not tied to her past anymore. I took her away from that. Actually, she was already heading away from it anyway. She was already cutting off ties. But the Lord blessed me because she's built just for me. But I was able to give her a new name. My wife carries my name. And she makes me proud. At the city gates, man, everyone's like, oh, JJ's wife, man, he's, he's blessed. You know? And I say, thank you. I know. <laughs> my wife carries my name. We carry the Lord's name. If we're truly the church of God, and he's our husband, He's given us so much. He's already changed our name. If he's done this much for us already. If he has called us his bride. He's going to fulfill his promises to us. He's not he's not going to fail. He never has and never will. God's the same yesterday, today and forever. His promises. He's going to fulfill his promise. But we need to keep that promise. We need to keep walking that promise Reminded of Galatians 6, verse 9. It's a very familiar verse, uh, a verse that uh, one of my brothers blessed me with um, a few months ago, and it's just, it's, it's, in, it's in my stack. It says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I want to challenge you, church, don't give up. God will fulfill His promise to you. He will fulfill His promise to us. He's going to do it, but don't give up, church. Keep his promise that he made to you. Keep his promise that he made to us and continue to walk in this promise. Don't give up, church. If you want to turn to James 1.12. See, we're coming to the, the, the point of our message. The point of us being faithful to what God has given us, as us learning how to walk faithfully with Him in a time of prosperity, that it's not a time to just sit and relax and sit on the sidelines. It's not a time to just enjoy yourself, enjoy the peace and the freedom. It's a time to continue to do the work and continue to do the things that He has told us to do in the past. It says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. See, it's amazing that God has given us promises here on this earth. He has given us things that he desires for us to have. He has given us uh, things that he wants for our lives. We have promises that we can, we can look forward to. But isn't that amazing? Once we stand the test, we will receive a crown of life. See, we can get so easily caught up on the earthly promises, but there's also heavenly problems. There's also heavenly promises that he wants to give us that we can actually receive a crown of life. See, he's given us great promises. He's giving us even better that we can receive a crown of life. So I'm reminded, it's the last scripture I'll share. We're not going back to Isaiah. Uh, we'll go to Romans chapter 4. This is uh, a uh, passage that's very dear to me. Um, let me just start by saying, for all the women in the room, if you don't go to the women's meeting, you should. You're missing out. Because I, uh, especially if you're of the, the married selection, what you get from that meeting and come back and bring and share with your husbands, man, it's life. There's so much life in it. And this is one of those times that blessed me. See, uh, when I'm thinking about promises, I'm thinking about, Lord, are, are you going to finish it? Are you going to fulfill it? Uh, I think everyone by this point knows that, that a definite promise that he has given us is why I'm not just going to mention it. Psalm 27, 13. Uh, I remain confident that he's going to fulfill his promises, that I will see his goodness in the land of the living. 
Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. God's given that to us. Uh, and it's not just for the healing of, of our child, but it's also the promises that he's given me. And, uh, and this is another verse because uh, when, when my wife came back from the women's meeting, um, what they were teaching is there's, there's certain lies that the enemy tells you that he tries, to, um, he tries to discourage you with. He tries to just put in front of your face uh, because he's trying to keep you from walking in the promise. That's the goal of the enemy. His goal is simple. Steal, kill, and destroy. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. And so what he does is he, he shoves lies in front of your face to keep you from walking those promise. And so we were discussing just, you know, what are some lies that the enemy is telling you? Because I want to encourage you. So she shared some with me. I was able to find some scriptures for her uh, to be able to encourage her. And uh, I shared some lies with, you know, if I'm thinking the enemy is attacking me. This is what he's saying. And she found scriptures for me. And this is one of the scriptures she encouraged with me. This was a lie. Uh, be a little late in the inside scoop on my life. Uh, one of the lies the enemy tries to tell me is that I miss my season or I miss my time. And so this is the, uh, this is the scripture that uh, the Lord gave my wife to give me to encourage me. Romans 4, starting in verse 18. It says, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Without weakening his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. See, if the Lord has promised you something, church, we need to be fully persuaded. No matter what the circumstances look like, no matter if there's a storm outside, we're sitting in our tent and there's a storm blowing. Oh, Lord, this tent's going to blow away. I know it. I just know it. No, that's not what the Lord has said. The Lord has promised you. He says, stretch wide your tents. He says, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. This is the place that you're supposed to be. That's what the Lord has promised. He's not going to fail. No matter what the circumstances look like, he's not going to fail you. It says, Abraham was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. You see, he turned his focus off of not having. He knows he doesn't have a kid. And it's pretty obvious he doesn't have a kid. But he takes his eyes off of what he doesn't have, and he puts it on the Lord. It says he gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he would, had promised. See, he persuaded. He was fully persuaded. He was walking in that promise and letting the Lord fulfill that promise. I want to encourage you tonight that the Lord's going to fulfill the promises that He gave you. See, God's given us promises as individuals. He's spoken to us individually. Um, he's spoken to us as families, what He desires for us to do. Uh, given us a mezuzah, a purpose that drives us. And no matter where we are in the world, this is what we're going to be doing. He's given us great promises. God's been so gracious to us. He's even given us a corporate promise. What do you tell us in the new year? This is going to be a year of prosperity. God's going to fulfill his promise. But we have to keep our promise. You see, he will keep his promise because he is a faithful God. That, I mean, that's just he's a faithful God who does no wrong. But we need to be faithful in keeping his promise for us and for the people all around us and generations to come. Let's be faithful in keeping his promise, church. It's beautiful, the fact that God has always been faithful, and He desires for us to be just like Him. It says about Jesus that He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that we're supposed to be like Him, that we're actually filled with the fullness of Christ. Isn't that amazing? That He desires us to be faithful, just like Him. See, we actually have to take off the old self, and we have to put on the new self, and we have to be faithful to do that. What we're talking about is this how you, this is how you walk in that prosperity. This is how you walk and be faithful with Him in every way, is by taking off that old self, putting on the righteousness that He's designed each one of you to be, and to be faithful with it every single day, today, tomorrow, the next day, and to be faithful with the rest of your lives. Let's stand to your feet, church. We have a timely word that was given to us tonight. 
If you think back over the past few services, including titles of our sermons and what the Lord has been speaking to us, He's been speaking to us about Him being faithful to His promises. From piercing promises, to sin-crushing promises, to promises that He would build His name, to promises that He will build His tent and wants us to do the same, from promises that He would send His fire and His glory to us. He's not the problem in this. He is telling us over and over and over again. Do you know why he's doing it? Because he's trying to encourage us. How did Nick open up the service tonight? That the Lord was reminding him that his lampstand was here. That there was a promise that his spirit would be here with us. You see, if we're going to stretch out, what does that mean? That means that we need to take full advantage of what God has already given us and that we might stretch beyond that. You see, most of us don't need to stretch out because we have not yet occupied what He has already given us. Uh, Megan, uh, Joshua, chapter 17, verse 14 and 15. We'll see. The people of Joseph said to Joshua, Why have you given us only one allotment and one portion for an inheritance? We are a numerous people and the Lord has blessed us abundantly. Can't you say that? I mean, can't you just take heart, take that to heart tonight? We are, we are a blessed and a numerous people and the Lord has blessed us abundantly. Look at the next verse. If you're so numerous, Joshua said, and if the hill country of Ephraim is too small for you, go up into the forest and clear land for yourselves. Go up and defeat the giants that you need to. See, your inheritance is allowed to be what you're allotted Plus, somebody say plus, Plus. what you go get. See, it's almost like you get to start stretching out and God will be with you to say, you stretch out. Um, What direction do I stretch out? Yes. Um, Do Joshua 18, 3. So Joshua said to the Israelites, how long are you going to wait before you take possession of the land the Lord God has given you? I encourage you with this tonight. How long are you going to wait until you actually, the space that he has already given you? See, I want to, I want to encourage you to stretch out, but for some of you, stretching out is moving beyond the one spot that you have and in enjoying the presence of God, what he's already assigned to you. See, I can't even tell you to stretch out yet because you haven't occupied what he's already given you. You got to stretch out, church. This is the right word for us. You can be confident that if you stretch out, that if you live as children of the promise. See, I was listening to these guys. I'm taking notes tonight. You got to live as children of the promise, not as children of the slave. You've got to actually occupy what the Lord has given and then go beyond that you got to stretch out. Throughout the book of Exodus, God says that He is going to stretch out His hand against people. And you know what He does? He says, tell Aaron to stretch out His hand. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand. See, when God wants to stretch out, we are the ones that actually do the stretching. We are the ones that have to enlarge the borders that we have. When we give abundantly, when we go after this with all that we have, you know what it says in 2 Corinthians 9? That He's going to increase and enlarge our harvest of righteousness. See, I want us to be able to stretch out into all that He has for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. We're going to read a few verses here, Megan. But as surely as God is faithful. Somebody say God is faithful. faithful. Don't you love the way that starts? But as surely as God is faithful. Have you forgotten that God is faithful? Oh, no, pastor. Have you forgotten it in your everyday life? You know what I'm doing as pastor? I'm going around and going, you have every reason to be confident. The Lord is trying to encourage. He's been faithful even when you're not. How much more when you really are going after this? Lord, Lord, I'm not playing. I, I may falter, but I'm going after this with all. I'm going to stretch out and grab everything that you have for me and more. I'm going to occupy the allotment, and then I'm going to go get anything else that I need because you're with me. As surely as our God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. 
For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no. But in Him, it has always been yes. Come on now, it's time to stretch out because His promises are yes. For no matter, oh my goodness. For no matter how many promises God has made, No matter how many promises God has made to you, no matter how many promises he's made to this church, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. See, it's time for us to stretch out, church. It's time for us to occupy all of the space that he's given us that we might then go beyond it. For so many of us, we're not yet at the stretching out. Us stretching out is just... Stretching out right here where we are. See, if your heart is longing for something else somewhere else, then this is not the stretching out that we're talking about. You got to stretch out and occupy what the Lord has already done in you. You got to stretch out what He has already promised. We want to see those things fulfilled. We want to be walking in these things. This is what the call for God, from God, for us tonight is. We must first stretch out to occupy what he has given us, and then we can stretch out beyond that. We're going to worship here for just a few minutes. It's time that you stretch out, church. He keeps saying it to us over and over and over and over again. It's because it's no problem for the Lord to keep saying it over. It's actually for our good, and it safeguards us, like Philippians 4 would say. It's no problem for him. He can do this for us again and again because he's a good father. See, when he's telling us that his lampstand is among us, it's not so that we might walk around in fear. He's saying, no, 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 I'm with you. His promises are yes and amen. We're going to pray. We're going to worship. I need you to stretch out. I need us to quit staying in the small, same little fishbowl of a circle that we have been. The same little cycle of a few weeks where you're glorious in God and then you're like, Lord has forsaken me. And then it's awesome again. And then, oh my God, what am I going to do? Yeah, we need to kind of get over this. The Lord is saying, let's go on to maturity, folks. Let's actually believe that what he says is what he's going to do. That we can walk with confidence. That we can walk in bold, crazy, room-shaking, earth-shattering kind of faith and kind of confidence in Him. Not just when you're here, but when we, we can actually do this. You can do this because the Lord is with you. It's time for us to stretch out. Mighty God, we stretch out our hands to you as the signal that we are going to stretch out our faith to you tonight. Lord, we need your presence. God, we need boldness, Lord. And you're giving it to us. Your promises are yes and amen. No matter how many promises that you've given us, they are yes in you. Lord, we are going to say this, that you might get glory in us. How long will we wait until we take our inheritance? Lord, we're saying we've waited long enough. Lord, we want to occupy every bit of space that you've given us. Move it upon our hearts tonight, God. Move in our lives. Lord, let us stretch out to you now. Stretch out in faith. Stretch out in life. Stretch out in boldness, Lord. Lord, we love you. We are stretching out to you now. Move in this place and move in our hearts in Jesus' name.